This is South Korea, one of the most successful countries in Asia, only really falling behind Japan, Taiwan and Singapore in terms of economic prosperity. South Korea has grown in just the past five decades from an agrarian backwater devoid of industry and natural resources to one of the world's most dynamic global economies. It is home to internationally recognised companies that make world-class products ranging from cutting-edge consumer electronics all the way to heavy industrial machinery and the container ships that have helped open up every other economy in the world to global trade. How it successfully made the transition to become a properly advanced economy is just one part of what makes South Korea so fascinating. The country is of particular interest to a lot of economists around the world because in many ways it's about two decades ahead of other major economies in the West on a lot of important issues. South Korea is either about to have its best decade ever or one of its worst, and whichever way the economy goes can give us a lot of insight into what our own economic futures have in store for us. All of this is to say nothing of the country's vital industries and geopolitical position in the world. It doesn't get as much attention as Taiwan and the global computer chip cold war, but South Korea is the world's second largest producer of high-end semiconductors, an industry that has the potential to both bring them a lot of economic benefits, but also a lot of unwanted attention. So, what are going to be the drivers of South Korea's potential growth in the next decade? What are the obstacles that could undermine its entire economic system? And finally, why is this all so important to economists even outside of Korea? Once we've done that, we can put South Korea on the Economics Explained National Leaderboard. This episode of Economics Explained was brought to you by Seeking Alpha, an online investing research platform and community that offers insights and education into the financial markets, no matter your current level of understanding. Research shows that individual investors collectively underperform the stock market because their decisions are often driven by emotions, such as overconfidence and overreacting to recent market trends. Seeking Alpha's Alpha Picks removes this emotion by providing you with two data-driven stock ideas each month based on quantitative analysis of key metrics like valuation, growth, profitability, momentum, and EPS estimates. The portfolio based on Alpha Picks quantitative model outperformed the S&P 500 after its launch in 2022. For now, to new subscribers, you can get access to Alpha Picks for just $99 a year by following the link in the description below. In addition to that, Seeking Alpha is offering a free one-month premium subscription to the Economics Explained community. Seeking Alpha Premium is the leading community for engaged investors and the best source of investment analysis and opinion out there. Click the link below for a special deal. Alpha Picks for $99 plus one month of free Seeking Alpha Premium. South Korea is home to a lot of world-leading industries that have the potential to make it one of the wealthiest economies in the world within the next century. Local industries, even ones with a heavy export focus, can only get a nation so far. Housing global companies that can draw value from the entire global economy is essential for countries that want to move beyond a certain level of wealth. BMW's biggest manufacturing facility is not in Germany. It's actually located in South Carolina in the USA, where it uses components shipped from Mexico, made out of materials mined in Brazil and Canada, to make cars that it sells through its dealership network covering all of North America. The entire manufacturing, logistics and sales process never touches German soil, doesn't use any German resources, and apart from a few company executives sent from BMW Global Headquarters, never even employs any Germans. But once a car has been sold, it's a German company that makes the profits. South Korea has a lot of large corporations with similar operations all around the world. Samsung, Hyundai, LG, Kia and Daewoo all sell well-known products globally, with many of their operations taking place outside of South Korea. The country is also home to the world's sixth largest steel producer, despite having almost no iron ore deposits themselves. They import raw materials from all over the world, refine it into high quality steel parts and then sell it at a huge markup to countries like China, Japan and India who need it for their manufacturing or to build out infrastructure. That steel also goes to fuel its own industries. Global trade and economic cooperation has been one of the biggest driving forces of economic growth over the past century. Global GDP lines up almost perfectly with global trade value because the more that countries trade with one another, the more they can specialise to provide the global economy with cheaper and better goods and services. 90% of global trade is done using massive container ships and bulk freighters because they are the cheapest way to transport goods over long distances. Countries that have direct access to the oceans are on average much wealthier than landlocked countries. Outside of Europe, there is not a single highly developed landlocked country, and 9 out of the 12 countries with the lowest human development index scores are landlocked, despite only accounting for a quarter of all countries in the world. The only reason that European countries like Switzerland get away with being landlocked is because they grew their economy before global trade was such a determinant of economic success, and most of their economic output these days is in the form of services or extremely expensive items that don't cost much to transport relative to their overall value. Landlocked countries are at such an economic disadvantage in the modern global economy that the United Nations has a classification just for them, LLDC, which stands for Landlocked Developing Countries. 
South Korea is obviously not landlocked, and given who its only neighbour is, it's effectively an island with easy access to the world's oceans on three sides of its borders. The reason the problems experienced by landlocked countries are relevant to South Korea is because it shows just how important being able to transport things by ship is in our modern interconnected global economy, and South Korea is home to the first, second, third and fourth biggest shipbuilding companies in the world. Without the ships that South Korean builders provide, one of the biggest driving forces of economic growth would simply grind to a halt. There is currently the fear that the world is starting to shift away from globalisation, and that trade tensions, active conflicts and the weakness of supply chains shown by the global pandemic will push countries to produce more domestically and ship less internationally. That is a problem, but it is more than made up for though by the overall growth in economic output, the demand for newer, much larger and more fuel efficient ships, and the demand from countries that want to build out their own merchant marine fleets for the very same reasons as they don't want to be dependent on other countries for access to vital goods and services. This is far from South Korea's only globally vital industry as well. It is the second largest producer of advanced semiconductors in the world, and when China and America are almost fighting a cold war over access to these chips, it's going to continue to be an industry that does very well for South Korea. Now all of this is not the reason why South Korea's economy is so interesting. For all of the economic benefits that these industries are providing, the country is also experiencing something that could potentially be a bigger boost to their economy than any shipyard, global car company or semiconductor plant ever could be. That is the rise of Korean pop culture all over the world. Korean bands, Korean skincare, Korean movies and shows, Korean fashion, Korean holidays and even Korean plastic surgery have become highly demanded products all over the world. The example of Germany and BMW I gave at the beginning of this video was no accident. They were able to make money by running a business that operated entirely offshore, but German brands have a big advantage when they do this. When we think of German cars, we think of quality engineering, luxury fit and finish, cutting edge technology, and a level of status above economy cars from other countries. The reality is that most BMWs sold these days are built to economy car standards and are less reliable with less features than similar offerings from Japan, or indeed South Korea. Some of the research team here at EE are from Germany, so I hope this makes them just a little bit angry. Despite their problems though, people are still willing to pay a premium for their cars. Part of this is BMW's marketing, but part of it is the perception that people have of Germany and their skilled engineering. How much would you pay for a watch from Thailand? And how much would you pay for a watch from Switzerland? A handbag from China or one made in France or Italy? A set of tools from the USA or a set made in India? financial advice from an accountant in London or Manila in the Philippines. Global consumers have perceptions of the quality of goods and services coming from certain countries, and they are willing to pay a significant premium to companies from countries that have a good reputation, even if the quality is the same or even worse. Countries with good reputations can add huge markups to their exports, or if they're really good, make money from their reputations as world leading German engineers to sell cars made in South Carolina, Mexico and China. The South Korean wave, as it's been called, is going to let Korean companies do the same thing. Fashion, entertainment and tourism are massive industries that are only going to get more profitable for Korea as its reputation in these industries grows. Hyundai was once the cheap car brand that people bought because they couldn't afford anything better, but now they are producing cars that compete with the very best offerings from Lexus, Mercedes, Audi and BMW, and they are doing well because South Korea no longer has the international reputation for being a random Asian centre of low cost manufacturing. But just as you might be thinking that the South Korean economy is going to be unstoppable, it's also got some major challenges ahead. South Korea has been a victim of its own success. As its population has become wealthier by working demanding jobs and moving to space constrained cities, people have been having less children. South Korea now has the lowest birth rate of any country in the world, with only 0.84 births per woman. This low birth rate combined with longer life expectancies means that by 2070 half of Korea's population is expected to be over 65. For an economy, that simply will not work because a lot of elderly people need full time care while not contributing anything to economic output. This issue is so severe in South Korea that it's not even a case of the economic burden that an ageing population would put on young generations that have to pay higher taxes to fund pensions, it's that there will not be enough people to look after that many elderly. Even elderly people that don't need full time carers generate demand for plumbers, baristas, shop attendants, drivers, gardeners and well every other job that exists in the economy. By 2070, more of these jobs will be automated, but most economists agree that it's not going to be enough. The usual solution for advanced economies dealing with this problem is to bring in young skilled workers from poorer countries, 
who will happily move to take the chance to make higher incomes and have a better quality of life than they could have in their home country. This is a devastating trend for the countries that they come from, but we addressed that in our video on brain drain so I don't want to repeat too much here. It's not a concern for South Korea anyway, because they are an advanced country with very high living standards globally, so they would typically be the recipient of skilled labour coming into the country, not skilled labour leaving it. But they aren't. South Korea has a similar problem to Japan, which is that culturally they are opposed to migrant workers. Korean is not a common second language to learn, and skilled migrants going through the amount of effort to get a working visa in South Korea would typically be better off going through less effort to get a working visa in one of the dozens of other advanced economies around the world. The South Korean government has made efforts to improve this trend because, well, they need to, but the country still remains low on the list of destinations that people want to move to in order to start a life, and the country's existing citizens are just fine with that. A more imminent problem that South Korea will need to deal with this year is its unique housing market. South Korea has a similar problem to a lot of other Asian economies that have been experiencing a period of rapid development in recent decades. House prices have risen much faster than incomes, and so the median home in Seoul is 14 times the median income. To get around this issue, the country has developed a unique way that people can pay to live in a home. Typically there is three ways to get a place to live. Buy a house, rent a house, or be given public housing. South Korea has developed a fourth option, which is what they call Cheonsei, or a key money deposit. This system works by having owners lease their property out for a fixed period, but instead of charging rent, the people that will live in the house pay an upfront deposit, between 60 to 80% of the value of the property. Once the term ends, the people living in the house can get their entire deposit back, so effectively they have lived in the house rent free. The reason that property owners would agree to do this is it effectively gives them a zero interest rate loan. A popular strategy for cunning South Korean property investors was to buy one apartment, put key deposit tenants in it, and use their 80% deposit as a down payment on more houses. The reason that tenants don't just buy their own homes is because they often can't afford it. Key deposits are normally made using money that people have borrowed, and it's easier to borrow to put down a deposit than it is to borrow to buy an entire apartment. Some key deposit tenants also like the flexibility of being able to move between homes without paying rent. Despite the advantages though, this system relies on home prices going up. If we use the example of the property investor who was using the deposit money to buy even more properties, he would have a real problem if any of his tenants ever wanted to move out because he would need to give them their deposit back, which he doesn't have because he used it to buy other houses. Fortunately for him, in the past, that hasn't been a problem because the house could just be given to another key deposit tenant and their new deposit could pay for the old deposit of the people moving out. If the price of the property increased, the new deposit could be even bigger than the old deposit, so the investor might even be able to go out and buy yet another house. This is a great system until house prices go down. And now for the first time since the Asian financial crisis, that's exactly what they're doing. The South Korean government has introduced policies recently to disincentivize this literal house of cards, but that could potentially backfire and turn a slow decline in property prices into a panicked sell-off as over-leveraged landlords try to get enough cash to pay back their depositors as they're required to if they decide to move out and nobody wants to take their place. Even though massive global companies are commonplace in South Korea, most of the wealth of average people is still tied up in real estate. And if the key deposit system fails, it could easily undo all of the economic advantages that South Korea could benefit from in the next decade. Okay, now it's time to put South Korea on the Economics Explained national leaderboard. Starting with size, South Korea has a GDP of $1.8 trillion, which makes it the 10th largest economy in the world and the third largest in Asia. It gets an 8 out of 10. That GDP is spread out over a population of 51 million people, which gives the nation a GDP per capita of just under $35,000, which is in line with European countries like Italy. It's also the fourth most productive country in Asia on a per capita basis, only just behind Japan and Taiwan, and a fair way behind Singapore, but of course that's a bit of an outlier. South Korea gets a 7 out of 10. Stability and confidence is quite good. For all of the social issues that the country's massive corporations may cause, they provide it with a reliable source of foreign income, a good employment base, and relevance in the global economy. The country is also well governed with low levels of corruption, a well-functioning legal system, and has relative ease of doing business. It gets an 8 out of 10, only really been held back by its position in the current geopolitical climate. Economic growth in South Korea has been strong in previous decades, and that's how it's gone from an undeveloped agrarian economy to the fully industrialised advanced economy it is today. Now its growth rate is more in line with other advanced economies around the world, and in the last decade it has grown by roughly 50%, so it gets a 7 out of 10. Finally, industry. 
South Korea has grown a diverse selection of crucial and world-leading industries that add a lot of value to its domestic economy and the global economy. While its industrial sector is still not as large as the true economic superpowers of the world like China, the USA and even Japan, it still gets a 9 out of 10. Altogether, that gives the economy of South Korea a 7.8 out of 10, which puts it way up here on the leaderboard, a position that is very well deserved. Check out the video linked on screen next, or if you prefer to listen to these videos, we make all of them, as well as full interviews with world-class economists, available on our Spotify page. Thanks for watching, mate. Bye.